Here we have a Honda CB954 uh, motorcycle engine on a stand here. It's uh, getting rebuilt. Just put in um, new bearings and rings and all that. So right now uh, the orientation of the engine is, is upside down. But we get a good view into the transmission, which is in here. And so I thought I would kind of explain how it works. So in a lot of motorcycles, the transmission is integral to the engine, or, you know, kind of housed within the same same cases. This has two case halves, uh, a bottom, well, the upper half is down, because how it is on the stand, and then the, the bottom half here, and then there's going to be an oil pan that goes over here, and, and this is your oil pump uh, here, so there's a pickup into the pan. Your oil filter housing is here at the front, and then this is your oil return uh, for like the relief valve, so it can maintain a steady pressure in the system. And your oil pump is driven by a, a little gear right here. So this is a multi-disc, uh, kind of a stacked disc clutch. You can see it here, and I'll open that up in just a sec. But here we have uh, a gear-driven part that's gear driven off the crankshaft. So the crankshaft is, is right here. And so when the crankshaft spins, this spins. And the shaft going through the center is actually on a bearing so that the shaft can spin independent of that outer housing. And this shaft has a spline on it. You can see behind the, the nut there. So this part of the clutch assembly um, has the spline on it, and really what this is, is so it's a, it's a stack of uh, little friction material pads and discs, steel discs, and uh, these springs on the top. So these springs on the top um, give it a squeezing pressure to hold that whole stack together, and that's what transmits the force from the outer portion to the inner portion that's on the splines and turns the transmission. And when you pull the clutch cable, it actually lifts up on this little pin, which lifts up on this top plate against the springs, and that opens up the space between the all of the discs, and that allows the uh, the, the the discs to slip, so that the, the transmission is no longer engaged from the engine. So all these bolts are loose. So if we lift this cover piece off. We can see inside now. This we have to replace this. This has a broken, uh, a broken boss for that top cover plate to to screw onto. But what there is is there are these alternating stacks of friction material, and then a steel disc, and friction material, steel disc, friction material, steel disc, going all the way down. And the way it is is the steel discs have the splines on the inside, so they lock onto the, the inner part, and the friction disc materials have the teeth which line up there on the outer part. So the outer part holds the, the friction discs, the inner part holds the steel discs, and when these springs clamp it all together, it all turns as one unit. Pull the clutch cable, it pulls up on this little pin, lifts up on this plate, you can see this plate has a you know surface there for the friction disc to go against. Lift up on this plate, it opens up the whole assembly, and now the uh, you know the discs can spin independently of the or the the friction parts can spin independently of the smooth ones, and the clutch is now disengaged, and the engine can spin freely of the transmission. So the way transmissions typically work is you've got two shafts, an input shaft and an output shaft. Here the output shaft has the sprocket that goes to the rear wheel. And there's a set, there's sets of clustered gears that live on both shafts and the gears are all meshing at the same time. And the way it's set up is they alternate. Um, if one of the gears is fixed on the input shaft, then it freewheels on the output shaft. And if one of the gears is fixed on the output shaft, it freewheels on the input shaft. And then we have a series of, of forks. This is a, a, little, a little kind of a, a fork-like piece of metal that goes in the gear, and that gear can slide back and forth on, on the shaft. 
and so when these gears slide back and forth, they kind of engage or lock onto their neighbor, which is a fixed gear. So you have all the in neutral, all the gears are have, have one of their sets that are free spinning, so you can have the input shaft spinning and the output shaft is doing nothing. And then when you put it into first gear, it's going to select, it's going to lock the idling first gear gear onto the shaft, and then when the engine spins, the shaft spins with it. And then when you go to second gear, it unlocks first gear, locks in the second gear, and so forth throughout the gears. So in a standard car that's a stick shift, as you move the lever, uh, it, it moves the forks in there to, to shuttle the gears between first and second, or third and fourth, or fifth and reverse, however your transmission is set up. On a motorcycle, you have your, uh, you know, your, you know, your shift selector is um, a little lever for your foot, and so it either just moves up or down. So the way this works is when you move your foot up and down, there's this long barrel-like um, metal cylinder here that has these grooves, these little tracks uh, machined into it. And you can see that each of these forks has a little pin that rides in one of those grooves. So as this moves back and forth, we can get those forks to move around by sliding in their corresponding grooves. One thing I want to point out is being a motorcycle if, uh, transmission is, you know, neutral. Most motorcycles are one down and then the rest of the gears up. The, this little um, brass button here is the new, neutral selector switch, which is connected to a wire. And that way, when it's in neutral, you get the little green light on your handlebars. So when it's in a gear, that button is no longer depressed. So I'm going to show how it works when it goes through the gears. So with this hand, I'm turning the input shaft like the clutch would be turning it from the crankshaft. And we've got our sprocket here. So right now it's in neutral. Our little tang is touching the little button on the neutral selector switch. And so I can hold the sprocket gear still and I can turn the input shaft. Now when I push down this way and get it to, there it goes, so that is snapped into first gear. And so in fact this uh, fork has moved over this way so this gear is engaged. So now as I turn the engine input shaft, the sprocket gear has to turn. It has no choice. I can't hold it back. And it actually turns slower than the input shaft because of the gear ratio. So now I use my selector, the, my gear selector the other way. If I do it firmly, it'll go past neutral and jump right into second. That wasn't firm enough. Do it again. So now it's in second, and it has moved the corresponding fork on this side has moved this fork back into the middle position and this fork all the way over for second. Now when I go into third, you can see by the, the little crooked path or line in the cylinder here, it's going to move this fork over this way and these two forks are going to stay stationary. So that's into third. And so now every time I turn the crankshaft, the gear is spinning at a faster rate. If I do that again, this one's going to move back to the middle position, and then this fork is going to move over, and that's going to put us into fourth. So that's into fourth gear. Now if I do it again, we're going to have this fork stay in its path, this fork move over to the left, and this fork also move over to its middle position. And so that's fifth gear. And if I do one more, and you can actually see we're coming to the ends of our paths here, and this is because there's going to be no more gears after six, and that's, you know, just loops back around. So when I move to six, uh, these two forks will stay in their positions, and this one will scoot over to the side, like that. So that's sixth gear. And so now, for every one revolution of the crankshaft, we've got more than a revolution on the, the sprocket, so it's greater than like a one-to-one -one ratio.